Hello, this is Russell Moore, and you're listening to The Russell Moore Show, brought to you by Christianity Today. Every week, we explore here conversations and questions from a Christian perspective to help you sort out how to live as a follower of Jesus in confusing times. This week, we have a conversation to seek to do just that. Well, listeners, as some of you know, if you were to walk down into my library where I'm recording this, you would find first thing as you come down the stairs, a shelf with my favorite authors that I go to constantly. So you would find Wendell Berry and Walker Percy and Frederick Buechner and Marilyn Robinson. And I I noticed that with all of these, they tend to have a common theme, and that is that They write both fiction and essays and in in various other places as well. And the books by Marilyn Robinson have changed my thinking in monumental ways, ways I know in ways that I probably am unconscious of. So I am thrilled to have her with us today on The Russell Moore Show. She is, of course, the author of Gilead and Home and Lila and Jack and Housekeeping and she's written essays on topics too numerous to even to even list here. She has won many awards, including the National Humanities Medal in 2012. And she has a new book on Genesis coming out this month called Reading Genesis. And I was really fascinated and interested to read this book, and you'll see why in just a minute. Marilyn Robinson, thank you so much for being here today. It's a pleasure. Glad to be here. When I was reading your book, one of the things I thought about first was a quote from Stephen King back in at the beginning of the pandemic when he said that the universe seems to him like a horror novel, except that the universe lacks rationality. And so there's not a plot to it and that he he's trying to put a plot to it. That's not the vision of, of the universe that we have in your book. Why did you decide to look at Genesis particularly? Well, you know, since I'm interested in scriptural religion, I I, uh, have read and heard all sorts of interpretations. God knows, you know, for for thousands of years, there have been interpretations. And the modern ones, the written, I do not subscribe to their assumptions about how it should be approached. It took me a long time to realize that because what you learn with within that kind of culture, you learn with a kind of authority that might not be even conscious of itself, but can keep you from actually thinking, when I look at this, what do I see, you know? Yeah. And I think that um, the sort of scholarly seriousness of the approach to the Bible in general can get in the way of perhaps fresh thought. Hmm. Yeah, sometimes there are Christians who become disturbed. I've, I've noticed some of them who become disturbed when they when they see the similarities between the Genesis account and other creation uh, stories from the from the ancient Near East. You are not disturbed by that. So what do you see as being distinct about Genesis as opposed to all of these other creation stories? Uh, well, one thing, of course, is that there is one God and another that God and the creation that he made is essentially good, no matter what uh, complications human beings have introduced into it. You know, the old pre-Hebrew religious myths that are brought, you know, to bear on uh, comparisons between between Babylonian myths, say, and, and uh, Hebrew they were treated as sensational at the beginning, you know, as, as if now we know that the Bible is derivative. Now we know it's a pastiche of of other myth and epic and so on. And this kind of, a, it, it, it assumes passive receptivity on the part of the writers of Genesis and the Old Testament generally. In other words, the idea that they might use these stories as the basis of further thought on the same question, for example, what is the relationship between the divine and the human? That is not addressed, you know. It's treated as if it were an essentially sort of inert document from which one must insist on deriving certain things, you know, 
for example, that monotheism is different from paganism and so on. You you talk about in the book the way that there's not a detailed explained theodicy in Genesis, just as there's 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 not in Job the way that we would expect it. How how should we explain to someone who says, I read the text talking about and it was very good, and yet I don't experience the world that way. I experience the world as as very cruel. Well, you know, um, I mean, it is a theodicy. That is the great question that runs right through the Bible itself. You know, the crucifixion is very cruel also, you know. I think the the overwhelming goodness, as it were, of the fact that we exist and that we exist on this speck of, of planet, you know, with, with things that are simultaneous with our own needs, our own, you know, our own sense of the beautiful, our own powerful awe, and so on. I think that, you know, the essential sense of goodness has to be implanted in a realization of existence itself. What is man that thou art mindful of him? I mean, many people feel that the problem of evil is unanswerable, and therefore evil becomes the essential feature of reality as far as many people are concerned. I think that this is a, a question of perspective. Mm. Granting, granting God knows all the examples of of evil and grief and injury and so on that we can see every moment of any day. As I was reading the opening uh, chapters of your book, I thought about a quote in one of your other books, in I think The Givenness of Things, and I went and looked it up and found it because I remembered it, and you said this, but anyone who has spent an hour with a book on the new physics knows that our old mechanistic thinking, useful as it is for many purposes, bears about the same relation to deeper reality that frost on a window pane bears to everything beyond it, including the night sky and everything beyond that. And I suppose that hit me because I was talking one time to a physicist. He said, because we're the only ones who seem to know just how crazy the universe is. Do, do you think that that some of the, the things that we know now in terms of quantum reality and so forth, or that we're, we're knowing about what we don't know, is an avenue to awe and maybe a reconsideration of, of the universe as just a, a machine? To have thought of the universe as a machine. <laughs> No, and I certainly I love that new new conceptions of physics. I I you know I think that they very much complicate or erase the theories of kind of entrapment that that affects even the idea of God if you think of it in deterministic ways. You know, I mean I'm very shy of, of using science to confirm theological concepts because we we know the history of that in a way you know we know how you know religion goes on but science can fall by the wayside mm -hmm. <laughs> at the same time it, it's such a beautiful metaphor that it has very much affected the way that i think the idea that out of all possibility reality is selected you know that that the that god sustains what is for us a predictable and orderly reality, but has no necessity to be predictable or orderly, you know? Mm. You hear often about people that don't make any further kind of theological conclusions about that kind of physics. They will often say, well, it's random because, you know, anything's possible, but certain things happen, you know? But, but the physics itself sort of implies that there is activity beyond the perceived, you know, where where these choices are made. And and some people say, well, the observer can be an atom or it can be anything at all. But the idea is still there and the word is still used, you know, of, of uh, some system or mind or whatever it is of determination that exists. I, I don't mean that in the classic philosophical sense, I'm sorry. But there, if it is true that reality is simply recreated moment to moment out of infinite possibilities at the same time what we perceive of it what we live with 
as a consequence, is stable, then that, to me, implies this sort of conscious attention and will on the part of the God that is able to make it, that makes it continuously from moment to moment. It seems as though there's a proliferation right now in popular culture, whether in science fiction or films or all kinds of television shows, a focus on the idea of a multiverse. Yes. Why do you why do you think that seems to resonate so much right now with people? Well, I mean, I think it's a very interesting idea in the sense that it in it it reflects the wideness of what is implied in this new physics, you know, mm -hmm. the fact that it can make an articulate and plausible argument for an infinite existence of universes, which simply makes the existence of this one more striking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> If you look at really classic old theologians, very often they will say the universe is so large, there must be many planets and God must, you know, be, be graciously involved with all of them and so on. People act as if ideas were locked in in a way that historically they never have been. But simply having more planets would simply add to the the greatness of God, you know. Mm. That, it's not hard to find that that view of the question, even in old hymns and so on. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what was surprising to me about reading Genesis. I expected certain themes to, to be there, and, and some of them were, about the, the fact that human beings are mysterious, not just reducible to, to causes and effects. But one of the things I was surprised by is that this is a book about grace, about forgiveness, and that the Cain and Abel narrative shows up repeatedly here in ways that having just taught through Genesis and written on Genesis, I hadn't even thought about being there from Lamech all the way on to, to Joseph and his brothers. And you talk about in the book about someone who is from a different uh, culture who was listening to you teach on Cain and Abel and was morally shocked by the fact that God would protect Cain after, after killing his brother. And it struck me that, as with so many other things in the Bible, the familiarity that we have with it reduces that sense of shock that, that is intended here. Mm -hmm. It's true. I, I am so indebted to that woman who's, I didn't even talk with her and know by name it was a question that came up in a class you know but it shocked me too and that I think was the <laughs> that was the beginning of my reappraisal of of these stories you know because uh well the obvious importance of Cain and Abel as as a master narrative of of so much else you know and the fact that we can look at it assume that the mark of Cain which we know protected him was something that stigmatized him I mean, that's a very, that is the reading of it, really. And there that makes no sense at all. Well, it's also true that I think I've kind of unconsciously seen the story as primarily about Cain and Abel, rivalry, murder, sacrifice, so forth, and only secondarily about God's response to Cain. But after reading this, I'm I'm re rethinking that because mm -hmm. it seems that the most startling thing here is not just your brother's blood cries from the ground, but that God doesn't execute him. God God protects him, and that that's that's something that you you show and demonstrate repeatedly through this. Yes, well, I, it's such a strongly recurring theme, and you know, if if one were writing you know, an 800-page novel, and any idea recurred five times or ten times in the 800 pages, people would say, this is what this is about, you know. Mm -hmm. But here you have it occurring over and over and over again in a much smaller space, you know, and you don't have the reverse, mm -hmm. you, know? you know. I think that narrative is structured to be meaningful in the same way the language is. I mean, in the sense that you can look at a good narrative with confidence that it means something, you know, mm. that there are ways in which it develops meaning through repetition or reversal or whatever. 
it, these things are very characteristic of modern literature, but then the great urtext for modern literature really is the modern language editions of the Bible that occurred in the 15th and 16th and 17th centuries. Do you think that we've lost something by not having a common authorized version? No. In, no. I think when I when I was working on this, I had all kinds of Bibles arrayed on the table in front of me because how else to sensitize yourself to the nature of a complication or something, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think that we, you know, translating an, an ancient language that perished from the earth and as a spoken language so long, so long ago, a lot of people have striven very earnestly, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it's a Complutensian polyglot, you know. I think that their efforts ought to be viewed respectfully, and comparisons made where they seem valuable. But I, I, I don't think we need one authorized version. We just mm. need reasonable curiosity. Mm. Social psychologist, moral psychologist Jonathan Haidt has written about the, the current era, fragmented as we are by social media and resentment and polarization as being a tower of Babel. And I wondered as I was reading your account of, of Babel, whether you would agree with him that we're, we're uniquely in a situation like that as opposed to other eras. Or is this just the way the world is in <laughs> and uh, we have a particular expression of it now. Well, you know, in the actual story of Babel, it, it is God that creates languages, you know, and he doesn't subordinate any language to any other, you know. It's a way of basically sort of disarming people, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, creating virtual places in a sense in the world by creating different languages, you know. Mm. I think that, you know, that the Babel story is a, an act of intervention on the part of God, whose presence seems to be oddly forgotten much of the time, that sees human possibilities as dangerous to human beings mm. and steps in and precludes that kind of development at that moment, but doesn't disable people, doesn't punish them doesn't create invidious comparisons among Babylonians and anyone else, you know. So, in other words, if there's an analogy to Babel, I think that it should be that people that live perhaps in, in scattered cultures and so on can participate in something global, which could be wonderful, and so, as it always does on what we make of it. Right before I read this book, I was teaching on Joseph, and I made the comment that I find him a very unlikable figure, and in many ways an annoying figure, and <laughs> someone was shocked that I would say that. But the same, I was thinking about that as I was reading. I could say the same thing about Sarah and Jacob and and a few other people, and I think that's intentional. And, and you make the point that these people in this in this narrative are not intended to be heroic figures or examples of moral instruction, which I think a lot of people miss when they're they're reading Genesis devotionally and and they think I'm supposed to be looking at these people and learning then how to act and how to live. And I don't know quite what they see. I mean, it seems <laughs> me. I mean. I think we should be very grateful for the imperfections of all these people that God so endlessly loves. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if if we actually subscribe to the fact that we're all flawed and that that God is gracious, then this that's what we're seeing in the text over and over again. Yeah, you. I, I also thought as I was reading this book that I was hearing some echoes or explanations of sermons that 
Reverend Ames had preached in your your various fictional books. For instance, well, I think this was Boughton, I'm not sure which one, uh, maybe it was Ames, talking about Abraham uh, giving up of Isaac and about this entrusting of both Ishmael and Isaac to the, the wilderness. And I wonder if you were bouncing around some of the ideas that you would pursue here, even when you were writing the novels. No doubt, no doubt. The idea of grace, I think, is just surpassingly beautiful, you know. Mm. And it, it it makes instant sense to people when they understand what it is. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It, I mean, it, it feels like the thing, yes, called for, you know. And so that's been a sort of subject of my thinking for a long time. I, especially in a time when religion tends to be so prohibitive and and uh, punitive and so on, which always felt to me like a, an aberration, not not at the center of the religion. Mm. Well, the other thing I think that's unique here is your view of the quote-unquote Old Testament God. And I thought about as I was reading, and I went and looked it up again, a quote that was somewhere in my mind that you had said, and you did, and I think in what are we doing here, when you said a, a great many of us feel an emphatic moral superiority to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this is surely bizarre since, to say the least, Jesus shows no impulse at all to dissociate himself from him. I think there are a lot of people, even committed Christians and committed Bible readers, who do ascribe a kind of primitivity and sort of a wrathful picture of of God in in the Old Testament. Where do we get that idea? Why, why does that persist? Well, you know, I mean, it's a very important idea. The the uh, I think the receptivity to the idea that these uh, Babylonian myths and so on are simply the Bible before the Bible and so on. That's that. There's no basis for that, you know, reading them side by side certainly doesn't reinforce that opinion. But we're conditioned to think the Old Testament God is brutish and, the, you know, here they are in another, you know, another language and so on. But I think that more of it than we would like to acknowledge comes from a desperation that has occurred in especially European culture over centuries to make a distinction between Christianity and Judaism. Mm. You know, the impulse has been to say that this the primary impulse behind Christianity is not shared by Judaism, you know. And so things like love thy neighbor as thyself comes from Leviticus, you know. As in so many cases, Jesus quotes, you know, from the Old Testament. And an amazing number of people don't realize that he's quoting, even though there are footnotes, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, And they act, I think this is relevant, they act as if it's diminishing the authority of Jesus to say that as a pious Jewish man in the first (laughs) century, he's quoting what he calls the scriptures. Yeah. Well, one of the things that tends to be a scandal to people is the sacrifice, well, attempted sacrifice of Isaac. And usually when I see a treatment of that, there's a lot of moral hand-wringing quite a bit. I was struck that what you pictured here did not seem to be, well, let's talk about why it was moral or immoral for God to tell Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, but instead that this was a pictorial demonstration that God does not demand sacrifice and does not demand child sacrifice. So this was, it was almost a a revelation of God's kindness and grace, not something to be explained about God's uh, cruelty or arbitrary nature. I found that striking. Mm -hmm. You know, I found out in the course of my mulling things over that that, uh, there was Carthage, you know, and that Carthage was everywhere in the Mediterranean, all up the coast of of the Atlantic, that it was a Semitic language culture, you know. There's no way to think of it except as a huge influence. It could threaten Rome, you know. Mm -hmm. And they, archaeology seems to confirm, they've always had the reputation of child sacrifice. 
as a big kind of state ritual of, you know, and, you know, pathetic signs that people tried to smuggle a sheep or something in, in place of the child and then repenting and destroying a whole bunch of children, you know, um, ghastly, you know, and the the name Carthage is never spoken, never appears nowhere in the Bible. And we know they did that, you know, the dysphemism, the things that were unspeakable, you know. But we know also that, you know, the prophets tell us that this idea of child sacrifice crept in, you know, and that that they that it was felt to be an issue whether this could be practiced or not. And of course, the prophets are, you know, couldn't be more emphatic that it's, you know, but if if you know, if the meaning of of God's, you know, asking for the sacrifice of Isaac and and letting Abraham prove that he would make that radical a sacrifice, that he would be that faithful to what he took to be God's command, this is something that Abraham learns about himself, you know? But God says, yes, you know, a sheep will be fine. You know, <laughs> don't mm-hmm. do that, you know. I, it's it's a very potently instructive narrative, and I, I believe urgent, you know, urgent because there was this great example of Carthage, which, you know, great, powerful, rich, even created a literature, apparently, although it was all destroyed afterward. Everything Carthaginian seems to have been destroyed. In any case, I think that we don't teach enough background for the to make people understand that it's not just between Abraham and God. It's like dealing with a phenomenon that was important throughout the whole culture, the whole well, region. Why, as a as a novelist, as somebody who plots, why, and I'm, I'm not treating this as just a literary text here. Why, why does also God in his providence as he's writing this out, why do you have these themes show up repeatedly in Genesis of a a woman who is barren, who is given children in an extraordinary way, and also this theme of the eldest son being displaced by the younger? Well, I think that the... The, the, you know, the barrenness of women, Rachel and Sarah and son, makes a huge point of the preciousness of a child. And, you know, I mean, primogeniture, the you know, the favoring of the eldest, which the Bible ter- overturns repeatedly, it, it implies that there is something external to the circumstances of the birth in the sense of, for example, being born, simply born first, that creates the preciousness around the child that you know what I mean mm-hmm. uh, the the ability to be useful to God is at God's discretion it's not something that is institutionally created you know and I think that that you know the ter- overturning things you know that goes clear into you know the Magnificat and so on it means exactly that that among people who who is enabled, who is, you hate the word chosen, but who is, you know, uh, that is, that is at God's discretion, Mm. intention, you know, I mean, it's very hard to talk about things like that because we have these strange atemporal time scales and so on, you know. Yeah. When I said that Sarah is, not a likable figure in in my view. A lot of that has to do with her treatment of Hagar. Mm-hmm. And I I loved the section where you talk about Hagar quite a bit and about some of the themes of the baby crying echoed back later with with Moses and and God seeing her. Did did you set out to to give this special place to Hagar or did she just resonate with you as you were as you were writing? Well, you know, I think Genesis gives a very special place to Hagar. She is paired with with Abraham, you know. Mm. I mean, there is the the scene of her annunciation that occurs, you know. I mean, there these scenes tend to be back to back where Hagar is is given massive assurances from a, by an angel that her, her 
her progeny will be uncountably numerous. And then you have the same thing said to Abraham, you know. You have Abraham threatened with the loss of his child. You have Hagar threatened with the loss of her child. And just, you know, reducing it to something crude as word count, Hagar gets a great deal of ink, Mm -hmm. you know. And so I don't think that, I mean, I don't feel like I'm being feminist or anything when I simply say that the Bible seems to be, you know, that that uh, everything is done to underline her, her importance. Mm. You also talk about uh, in the book, and I think increasingly as the book goes on, the role of providence and how providence is really seen only in in retrospect. A lot of these narratives, it seems as though God's absent from it. And at one point you say another another word for this, but a word that's scary to people is predestination. And I, I thought about a comment you made, I think it was at Wheaton at a conference where you said, you know, people act as though Calvin is the the one who talks about predestination. Everybody <laughs> did and, and does. Why do you think that idea of predestination it seems to me it's really troubling to some people and it throws them into a a kind of fear of fatalism and it's really attractive to some people and i have noticed with sort of the resurgence of calvinism and i'm a moderate calvinist myself but the resurgence of, of calvinism within certain sectors of evangelicalism For a lot of people for whom predestination is really easy, doctrine of election is really easy for them to grasp, there comes a meanness and and, and almost a, a delight in that. How should we try to make sense of predestination in 21st century world? Well, you know, I've worried about that a good deal. (laughs) And, uh, you know, I mean, over years of time, not recently, so not recently, but I've come to the conclusion that people like Aquinas and and uh, Calvin and Luther and, and it, you know Chrysostom, no, not Chrysostom. He's he's the difference. But the if you have a conception of time that is deterministic, and you can't you can't finally free God from the deterministic order that prevails in the earth, you know. I think that all of them were trying to be intellectually honest about a conception of time that is not a true conception of time. They were thinking in the terms of their age, a very long age, I need hardly say, that, you know, that modern physics we were talking about allows us kinds of latitude that they did not have about what these kinds of terms could mean, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's an artifact of a period of time when a certain kind of thinking was authoritative that ought not to have been, and they dealt with it as well as they could, you know. I don't um, don't know what to say beyond that, except that I think that people want to feel that they have said the right creed or drunk the right communion or whatever and solved for once and for all the issue of their salvation. Mm. And that very often this means to them that people who have done not done these same things are, you know, doomed. But it's that's something that's built on top of what I would call it a mistaken conception of of how things work, basically, of, of whether God is free or not, you know whether we are free or not, which is, and I'm not saying I've solved that question. I'm just saying that the deterministic model doesn't deserve the authority that it has. Mm. I, I was thinking as I read this about the way that you treat providence with, for instance, Jacob and Esau, about the fact that this really is something that people who are grappling with regret should read. And and of all of the things that that had emerged as themes for me in teaching Jacob and Esau, that wasn't one of them as much. As when I was reading this, I thought, you know, what you really have here is someone, it, it struck me when you write, 
about this longing to be blessed that, that shows up in Jacob. And you talk about these events that are pictured very morally negatively and yet turn out to be included in, in God's plan. How, how does one take that mentality, for instance, that Joseph has, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good, without just being dismissive of the things that we regret? How, how do we find that balance? Well, you know, Joseph very graciously surrenders any right to accusation or punishment or anything like that. You know, he embraces his brothers as brothers. I don't think there's anything that indicates that his brothers stopped feeling regret. Mm. As their father dies, he comes, they come to Jacob again, you know, yeah. wanting and new assurances, you know. I think, I mean, of course, you know, you live with these characters for a while and then you begin to feel like you know them. Mm -hmm. I think you feel the weight of regret incredibly strongly in that household, living with this father whom they respect and, and love and knowing that he, they would kill him if they told him what he had actually done, you know. And it's, I mean, it's an almost intolerable human burden when you think of it, that weight of guilt and to have to trust in that, you know, the discretion and the secrecy of nine other people <laughs> you know, for whose character you cannot vouch. It's, you know, it's just dramatically amazing. And and certainly guilt is a great, is the flywheel sort of for, for all of that. As soon as things start to turn strange with the Pharaoh, so they take him with Joseph, they don't think, what have we done to offend him? They think, oh, we have done, we have killed our brother. Mm. You know. Well, anyway, it's very beautiful. <laughs> Shakespeare yeah. proud. Well, when when you talk about the passage that I I don't know why this hasn't stood out to me before, but uh, Jacob saying of Esau, seeing your face is as seeing the face of God, and we tend to we tend to think of Esau as a villain here. But you do have this demonstration of of mercy and grace from from Esau. And I, I thought about as I was reading this, uh, something that you said in Home, I think, where you said people say that you need to, if you understand, you can forgive. And in reality, it's the reverse. You have to forgive in order to understand, to put yourself in the posture of grace. And it seemed as though that that's what Esau is is doing here. Even after all of the the birthright to uh, giving up and everything else is he's he's demonstrating what God demonstrated with Cain. I'm not going to hold you to what you did, and I found that beautiful. Oh, it's very beautiful. It really, at the same time, it's very finely balanced because I mean Jacob is clearly still afraid of Esau, you know, mm -hmm. and you don't know if he's justified in that or not. You know, if he's just being Jacob again, or if if Esau is really, you know who shows up actually with a small army, which is, you know, not a thing you would ignore in the circumstances. It's, I mean, one of, one of the things that I would say about, about the Bible, about Genesis in general is things are so finely balanced. You so mm. often feel as if almost, you know, it's like quantum physics, you know, from moment to moment, things take the character they have. With this issue of, of mercy and, and forgiveness, I found it really interesting, your section where you talk about debt and about Jesus's treatment of debt. And of course, I think about being in places where there's the recitation of the, the Lord's Prayer. And sometimes people will have to say, this is the debts version, or this is the trespasses version, forgive us our trespasses. You talk about the difference between debt and trespasses, and we should think in terms of debt. Why is that the case? Well, I mean, I think that, I mean, how often, I don't know, it's a, but a, a rhetorical question, how often does Jesus bring up debt as the, the thing to be forgiven, you know? Mm. 
the the unhealthy relationship between one human being and another, you know. Mm. I think and and then of course you have all that massive legislation in in Deuteronomy especially where debts are forgiven routinely every 7 years ideally, you know, and then totally erased again at, at every 49 or 50 years. So the the debt as something that is antagonistic to appropriate social relations or familial relationships and so on. I don't think it's fair to think that that is a cruder concept than sin or trespass, that words that are otherwise uh, substituted for what Jesus himself said. But, you know, th- there is... Uh, decency there is uh, brotherhood there is everything that um, ought not to allow us to assume coercive relations with other people which is exactly mm. what that is you know and so you know it's a <laughs> it's a more difficult standard than trespass nobody i mean i could walk into a room and if i had access to the books i could say if there's debt involved but as far as trespass that depends on your perception you know your yeah. version of what happened so i think that it's a much tougher minded metaphor shall we say but also literal example of uh, how people ought to relate to one another mm. i had the sense as i was reading yeah. this book many times of a similar way that I feel when I'm reading the Gospels and and I just marvel at the way that Jesus responds. How you tie together the God who comforts a servant woman with the God who lets Jacob think, think he won <laughs> with the, the wrestling at the, the river and all of this long suffering and accommodation and and mercy and you talk about at one point to put aside power is godlike in a way that i think is is very counterintuitive to people who think that grasping power is godlike right right i mean i think anybody who has tried not to take advantage knows that there are a lot of muscles involved <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, that's one of the things that I really want to to perhaps help people to reconceive. You know, I mean, that it appears to me from Genesis and so on that, that God actually demonstrates his power by creating a creature that can oppose him. Mm. You know, and I mean, that's too simple a statement, but nevertheless, it's best I can do at the moment. But... You know, the, 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 if you want to make, you know, a human being, you know, crown him with honor and glory and so on, then you don't intrude and make things obvious and easy and, and, and unhuman, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and that, 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 didn't, that's the brilliance of the creation, you know. Do you think that's why God seems so hidden? There are many people who would say, I, if if God is there, then why is he so silent and why is he so invisible? Why doesn't he show himself in some way? Oh, I don't. I mean, I think that, you know, I think that reality is bathed in a certain kind of consciousness. Hmm. All of it, us too. And that we live in a continuous possibility of the knowledge of God and that it again it, it's our not knowing that is human you know it's you know I mean we know that the will of God in the sense of what he would hope from us is an awareness of him that mm. is of course counterintuitive beautiful you know and and we we express our human character it's it's about us the fact that we we don't see the world that God made, you know. You mentioned somewhere about someone saying to you, "Weren't you afraid to write on Genesis?" <laughs> and uh, you're saying that you no, you haven't had any any problem with talking about these things. 
Is that the way that you think, you know, in more secularized America, I think there are a lot of people who think there's hostility in some places where there's not hostility, there's actually actually curiosity. <laughs> and and we we tend to treat curiosity as hostility. Have you have you found that that people, even very secular people, are very open to hearing these stories again? Well, I think that people are secular in many cases because we have forbidden ourselves to talk in the way that we think, perhaps, you know. Mm. A lot of people at this point really don't know what religion is. They really don't. I mean, I remember when I was a child, it was kind of pervasive in the culture, you know, sort of, you know, routinely an area of thought that you could hear and be be educated by, in effect, you know. But we have, I mean, there there are people who are secular, I don't, you know, and really are for sound intellectual reasons and so on by their lights. But there are a lot of them that simply have no way of knowing what the conversation is, you know. And part of the problem is that there is a great deal in the way that Christianity is presented in the modern period that is very ugly. And that's just a fact. There are people who see the words God and guns linked together and are simply repelled and and actually imagine that that would be the kind of thinking they would have to subscribe to in order to, you know, in order to embrace religion. Yeah, I actually talked to a woman who had become a Christian and told her mother that she had, and her mother said, I can't believe that you would be for AK 47s. And the daughter said, Who said anything about AK 47s? But her mother thought that's what Christianity, by definition, is. Well, you know, who, who stand in the way of controls of AK 47s? Yeah. I mean, it's just a fact to be faced. Yeah. Um, and, and then there are a lot of people who who are much more religious than you would ever guess, but feel that it's a breach of decorum because other people might be offended by religion or, or, or you know, othered by not being part of it. But the big mistake, as you suggest, is interpreting n- no visible conformity on the subject as hostility. Mm. I mean, or or conflating hostility toward military weapons with a uh, hatred of you know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I think we're people that that lay claim to religion are very much at fault in creating a kind of religion that alienates people. That's not what we're supposed to be doing, you know. Do you have hope that we can transcend that? I do. And frankly, my experience does not discourage me. You know, I mean, my thoughts on Genesis are very widely of interest. I'm I'm so happy to see that they've had such a good reception, you know, and it's just because I think partly because uh, because they know my novels and stuff, I'm a sort of reliable interpreter, you know. I'm not going to come up with anything hostile, and, you know, punitive. Well, I cannot tell you how grateful I am to you for not only being on this show, but for your writing, which has changed my life over and over and over and provokes my thinking. Even when I'm not reading you, something just comes to mind and I'll have to go back and and find it. And so I'm grateful for your taking the time to be with us today. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed it. Very nice. In one of her novels, Jack hears from his father Nobody deserves anything good or bad. It's all grace. If you accepted that, you might be able to relax a little. (laughs) And I think that's true. So let's think about grace, forgiveness, mercy, and Genesis. Thank you, Marilyn Robinson. Thank you. If you enjoy The Russell Moore Show, take a second to share this episode with a friend or leave a rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. The Russell Moore Show is a production of Christianity Today. Executive producers are Eric Petrick, Russell Moore, and Mike Cosper. Host is Russell Moore. Produced by Ashley Hales. 
Associate producers are Abby Perry and Mackenzie Hill. Director of Operations for CT Media is Matt Stevens. Audio engineering provided by Dan Phelps. Video producer is Abby Egan. And the theme song for The Russell Moore Show is Dusty Delta Day by Lennon Hutton. <laughs>